Hi all, uh, this is Sunshine Menezes from Metcalf Institute. I hope you're all doing well today. I would like to welcome you to this mentor training webinar. This particular webinar is um, specifically intended to um, uh, help all of the mentors and co-mentors who are working with summer undergraduate research fellows this summer. So our two guests who are um, Dr. Bria Governor and Dr. Alicia Mosley Austin will be providing their insights and tips for effective mentorship, especially of undergraduate students, because that is a different story than the mentorship that you might provide to um, students who are further along in their studies. Um, so I just wanted to note quickly that this webinar is part of the Interthrust II Workforce Development Goals for CAIM. Um, you can see the, the primary goal for Interthrust II here and also I want to note that this is um, part of a broader suite of programs that we'll be offering called the Career Development Program. And you'll see more about that um, in the latest newsletter from Sean Kirby, the latest CA newsletter. And I'm happy to um, provide more detail on that um, if anyone has any questions. So today, as I noted, we're going to hear from Dr. Bria Governor from, the Rhode, Island, from Rhode Island College. Bria is a professor of biology there, and she's also the director of the Center for Research and Creative Activity. And then we'll hear from Dr. Dr. Alicia Mosley Austin, who is the associate director of the URI Interdisciplinary Neuroscience Program, and also director of graduate recruitment and diversity initiatives at the URI Graduate School. Um, so without further ado, I will pass the baton over to Bria. So one of the things that I wanna share is um, that as myself, a mentor of undergraduates and undergraduate research, I've learned a lot um, by doing and not necessarily um, always successfully. And so I have um, really benefited from a lot of different resources that have um, been useful in terms of my understanding of what makes an effective um, undergraduate research mentor. And um, some of those resources I'll highlight at the end um, are available through the Council on Undergraduate Research. Um, CUR, the acronym for Council on Undergraduate Research, is a wonderful professional organization and I had the opportunity to first attend um, a CUR meeting through funding from the previous EPSCOR grant and it really opened my eyes to the resources that are available through that um, community. Um, so I want to highlight those at the end also. But as part of that, I'll just mention that CUR has this great little book. It's very, very thin um, and um, it says how to um, mentor undergraduate researchers, and it's based on um, the results of several longitudinal studies that have shown the most effective strategies as well as the um, students' responses to um, mentoring. So um, distilling that down, I felt that there were, you know, really two um, characteristics of meaningful undergraduate experiences that um, came forward in the data. And one of them was the importance of group work. And a lot of us may think as scientists um, that we're collaborative teams, that we work together within our groups, that we're inherently doing group work, but there are some specific characteristics of why group work makes for a meaningful research experience for undergraduates. And the second is a relationship with the mentor. And again, I think that many um, people who go into um, the role of mentoring think of themselves as available and accessible and um, with the best intentions of making it a fruitful and rewarding experience for the student. But there are some specific characteristics, again, that students point out are um, the most effective for them. So in terms of working with groups, what I wanted to point out were some of the characteristics of what that group dynamic is um, that is so beneficial. So the first is the interactive nature of teamwork versus task work. So teamwork really creates dependencies among the individuals. And so rather than an additive individual activity where students maybe are contributing to a larger goal, if the students are able to work with you or work with other students, including graduate students or and or postdocs, where they can actually um, inform one another and not necessarily just kind of accumulating information toward the larger project, that can be very beneficial. The other is that, um, again, I mentioned my own experience that I um, sometimes found that students talking to students created misinformation where students didn't necessarily always have the right information, but more often than not, it is a, um, a benefit to the student to be able to work together. 
So one of the benefits of working in groups is that students can be, feel very isolated or alienated and um, in a laboratory setting, particularly if the first experience is over the summer. And so you want to encourage students to talk to students and provide yourself um, as a um, resource to fact check or to confirm or to review information with students that they get from other students. But oftentimes they just need a sounding board or they need someone to kind of translate for them what maybe they have, um, are trying to understand. And so an example might be, oh, do you remember what she said when blank or um, did you, you know, go through the autoclave procedure? Could you show me this part again or let me know where this is? So you don't want the students to feel um, alienated or isolated in the group. You really want to encourage them to talk to each other and then make sure it's clear that you're not interfering or, um, uh, you know, overlooking their, you know, looking over their shoulder by asking questions to confirm they have the right information. And then the third piece about the teamwork versus task work is to really provide feedback. So if you were to use the metaphor of a team in a sports um, analogy, you might think of the interactive nature being the different positions held by the different um, people on the team. So at the, you know, um, the front of the field or the back of the field, um, they have different roles and they're interactive with one another, but you also are the coach that provide feedback. So you're not just there again for oversight, but also um, to help inform and to help, um, you know, everyone, you know, fulfill their best um, role within that team. So those are some um, aspects about the team component of group work. But the other is your role as a coach or as the mentor in this situation is that you want to establish very clear expectations for communication within the group. So what are individual roles? At what point do you want um, the students to report to each other or to you based on this interactive model? So you may want in your lab every little detail to be reported to you. Um, you may want to be copied on every email. You may want to, um, you know, establish other kinds of communication in terms of, um, you know, like uh, informal messaging kinds of software. So you want to make sure that the students understand what their role is and when they are supposed to communicate with you as well as when you'll communicate with them. And then in this kind of third level of the team interaction where you want the um, other members of the team to communicate with each other. So that leads into the responsibilities also in terms of those expectations and the frequency and the contingency. So again, in some scenarios, like I want you to, you know, copy me on every email message about this work, or I want you to report at the end of um, this part of the experiment, um, that falls into the responsibility. But if that responsibility doesn't happen frequently enough or is happening too frequently, then you need to clearly communicate what that should be and um, what makes um, you know, do you want more of a digest at the end of the week or once a week rather than an everyday update? Also provide contingencies. If you're not available, who should they go to? So in a large laboratory setting, um, many people think of going to a postdoc or a graduate student, but if you're at a primarily undergraduate institution or you have a smaller lab, you might think of a colleague who might work um, with similar tools or techniques and may be available to answer questions. So provide those contingencies right up front, um, or if you need to travel or be away, um, to let the undergraduates know where they can go for additional assistance. So in terms of the relationship with the mentor, again, I think everyone is very well-meaning and wants to be available as a mentor, but there are some specific differences in terms of the role of the mentor um, that are different than the role of perhaps a professor as an educator. And one of those differences is the shift in from hierarchy to partnership. So in um, a course setting, for example, there are very clear roles where the professor has um, a hierarchical relationship to the students. Um, but in a laboratory setting, sometimes those things are broken down um, to be a little bit more informal. You might introduce yourself to be um, you know, called by your first name, or you might um, sit down and talk with your students more casually than you would if they were in your um, course. And this is going to be new to some students. And some students will be a little uncomfortable with it at first. 
Um, again, from my own experience, I might relate that I thought I was cool enough to talk to the students about what they were doing and, you know, how things are going, but I realized they saw me in a very different role, and they didn't necessarily want to relate to me in the same way until I established a, a more trusting relationship with them where they saw where I was coming from. But at first, it felt, I think, awkward for them that I was um, kind of interjecting myself into terms of casual conversation. And as the summer progressed, I think we were able to establish that, but I couldn't expect the students, especially those who've never participated in research, to understand that shift um, from hierarchy to partnership. Um, the other aspect is um, to consider goals that are relevant to the student. Um, and so the, a lot of these students, again, are very high performing. They are very goal oriented and very motivated. So they may already have in mind that they want to do the kind of research or participate in research that will lead to a publication, knowing that that is going to be useful to them as they move forward. But I encourage you to also ask them about their more intermediate goals. What are their goals for the summer? What are their goals out of this program? What are they trying to achieve as an undergraduate before they graduate? What is it that they want to do in the short term after they graduate? And maybe giving them some prompts or some ideas or examples might help them to establish those goals if they don't have them. Some students are so focused out on the horizon that they kind of can't see what's immediately in front of them. And that has two benefits. One, it can help them to see kind of the, um, the range of both intermediate, short-term, and long-term goals. But it also has the benefit of letting them experience some degree of success while they're in the summer program. You don't want all of their success to be measured on something that's beyond the length of this 10-week program. Um, I also mentioned here about developing a scaffolded scaffolded plan with scaled expectations and um, to build in repetition. So again, the, your role as a mentor is going to be to help guide these students to cheerlead and champion for them. So you want them to experience success early, and that might mean scaling your expectations so that while you want them to accomplish one um, particular activity within the lab, to build up to that might take smaller steps. Um, and that repetition might be doing dilutions or doing, um, you know, some type of uh, preliminary experiment where they can build confidence to move forward. So, um, you know, consider not necessarily setting the um, goals of the scientific objectives um, as the, um, the focus of the summer, but also some of those um, smaller steps that will lead to that um, scientific accomplishment. And then the last thing here that I'm going to mention is really to be available and responsive. And I think we know that availability can come in many different forms and is very case by case to the individual. Available could mean that you're quick to answer your cell phone if you're comfortable giving your number and you want to respond by text. It could be by email. Ideally, it's in person, but is it available in terms of being in the office or being in the laboratory, being in the field? Make sure that it's clear where you are. And then um, I think the previous point about having contingencies also translates to you being um, available in the sense that you are reachable. And so um, for the next 10 weeks, you really want to make sure that that is um, uh, clear to the students of where you'll be and, and, and how available you'll be. You'll see in some of the data in this book and other places that that is usually the number one thing that students say determines whether they had a good experience or not, or whether um, they got something out of the experience is whether their mentor was available. And then, of course, the other side of the coin to being available is being responsive. So availability, again, can come in many different forms, but responsive, you know, really try um, as quickly as possible to get back to those students because for them, this is all they have going on um, in terms of their research priorities for the summer. And so there is a, a really um, strong focus for them on every single activity that they're doing. And as they feel maybe a bit vulnerable being new at this experience, that your lack of response is going to be magnified for them. So they don't have maybe nearly the same number of scientific goals that they're juggling as you do. And so um, they're going to be much more attuned to how quickly you respond. Um, I've used here as the title of this slide and this kind of second point um, about um, the role of the mentor is um, a kind of the arc of a mentor to explain, demonstrate, guide, and encourage. And this always helps me, again, to kind of slow myself down and think about the different roles of a mentor. 
to not just um, kind of give the intellectual explanation of the content, but also to make myself available to demonstrate, let the student take the lead and guide them, and then let them take the lead where your role is really to encourage them. However, beyond educating students about the content of your research, you also want to give them some insight to the logistics and the purpose. So by logistics, we mean really the management of the research, what protocols are used, um, do you make protocols available in your laboratory or do you continue to refine them and edit them? Do you allow the students to um, play a role in that? And how do they access them? So are they printed in a binder that they can access quickly? Again, I'm going to use the example of an autoclave or dilution. Um, and can they make marks on that that they put into their own lab notebook or actually, um, you know, feedback into the lab protocols that um, will inform future students? Sometimes that other set of eyes can be really valuable to you. So don't assume that you have it all so clearly defined because even if a graduate student has done it with their prior experience, they might assume certain steps that an undergraduate will give you insight to. Um, other aspects of the um, logistics or the management or, uh, that are going to be really valuable to the student experience are thinking about time management. So if the student has put something into the autoclave and they have some time available, what should they do with their time? What's the most effective way to use their time while they're in the lab? Is that a good time to read a scientific paper? Or is it better to move on to set up for the next um, part of the experiment or to work on um, another aspect of the research? Um, also in terms of logistics, something that people maybe don't um, consider or take for granted is the role of community in terms of interaction. Who are your collaborators? Who are the people um, maybe even in the literature that have been um, influential in terms of, um, you know, steering some of the research direction in terms of these are the kind of major players in this kind of um, research area. What is that community like? And then also within the lab organization, you know, who uh, has different roles, both in terms of their dependencies on one another, but also how do they work together um, in the kind of oversight or management of the lab such as are there responsibilities, like you might think of at a coffee shop where this person is going to put the water in, this person is going to check the freshness, and this person's going to clean the coffee pot. Are there things like that in your lab that you can assign and maybe rotate um, week to week or every other week so that the students get some exposure to actually how to organize and, and manage a laboratory as well as the research itself? And then the third piece here that I would just mention in your role of educating the students not just about the content, but is also the motivation. Something that students don't always connect with is the human component of the research. So what got you into this field? How did you develop, um, you know, this particular interest? Is this something similar to what your PhD advisor or postdoc advisor has done? Or did you go out and do something completely different? Did you, um, you know, marry together two very different disciplines to come up with something more novel. You know, those kinds of um, decisions are, are the kinds of things that students haven't had a lot of exposure to and don't necessarily think that other people have had to deal with in the way that they might be facing the decision of what they want to pursue um, in their own studies or research. Of course, a lot of people do give the information about the context of the research in terms of, um, uh, you know, the greater um, scientific motivation for the work, um, but I think it is important to remind students that there are multiple ways of answering scientific questions. So maybe in your lab you use a particular technique, maybe you're really focused on the biochemical or molecular side, but there are other people who are going to take a different perspective in terms of genetics or physiology. Um, also in terms of application, are there other real world um, connections that you can make to this research that will help them to contextualize and maybe even explain their research as they're talking to others? So this slide I've um, titled with a, a little bit of uh, my own nerdiness of the importance of being earnest in terms of really your sincerity, but also in terms of your humanness. I mentioned the human component in terms of how you um, developed your own research interest and your own research program, but also um, the emotional honesty of being enthusiastic, get excited about your work, um, you know, geek out a little bit in terms of why you like it or why you think it's so cool or why you've dedicated your life or at least your career to this area. 
um, you know, let that show. I'm surprised sometimes that students will say that they don't see that from their mentors, but it comes up again and again um, that they respond so favorably to the enthusiasm showed by their mentor. Um, again, it seems like it would be a given, but just to remind everyone to slow down a little bit, be patient, be flexible. The students working with you this summer are not just there um, as an assistant to you, but you are playing a vital role in their development. Um, and um, this could be really the opportunity that helps them to shape, um, you know, their um, intermediate and long-term goals. So please be patient and flexible um, in terms of considering alternatives if they have different interests or they uh, reveal to you that they have um, additional goals beyond their research. Um, and I've alluded to this a couple of times already, but I'll just say again to um, you know, be interested in their goals. Some of you are people people and want to hear everything that the student has to say about um, their life and it comes very naturally to you to ask questions about, um, you know, their own interests. Other of you may be really focused on their research and, and kind of just, you know, get into the lab to get your work done. But, you know, in that case, I would really encourage you to take the time to um, show interest and um, extend yourself to be interested in their goals. So you might even need to step away from the laboratory setting to do this, um, whether it's your office or maybe ask them if they want to take a walk with you on campus to get a cup of coffee or sit out on a bench in the quad um, and ask them, you know, various questions. Again, case by case, some students are just coming into research for the first time. Some of them have um, been doing research and the first time they're doing research with you. Others of you um, know the students that you're working with already. But this would be a good opportunity to talk to them about um, career options, um, career paths in terms of also graduate school, the process, how it might be different than applying to undergraduate programs, particularly in some of our cases um, where students are really not thinking about different undergraduate schools. They went to the first one that was available to them or that they thought of, um, you know, within the state. And now when they go to graduate school, it might be completely new to them to consider leaving the state or going to a program that's um, determined by its offering and not its geographic location. Um, also, some of the nuances of applications, et cetera. So ask some of those leading questions. And based on their responses, try to connect them with um, your colleagues and other people who could serve as mentors to them that will help them to um, uh, engage with and, and to be successful in those goals as well. And then the last thing that I'll end with was um, something that I can provide more specifics on. Um, but this, again, came from the book that I just showed you from the Council on Undergraduate Research about what you can include in a letter of recommendation um, based on an undergraduate participation in research. And some of those things, I think, would require you to ask the kinds of questions um, that you would need to write a letter. And um, I, again, will share my own experience of a student um, who was working with me, very high performing student, but quiet, kept to herself, didn't really want to chit chat with me at all. And when she wrote her letter for graduate school, she was very vague about the kinds of obstacles she had faced and, and why she wanted to go into the work that she did. And so I asked her, you know, why is it that you withdrew from URI and then re-enrolled at RIC and why is it that you were a part-time student for several years? You know, can you give any more insight to this or is it just something that you kind of want to, you know, brush past? And so she took my um, suggestion of giving a little bit more detail and it turned out that she had a, a personal struggle in her family that required her to withdraw so that she could be geographically closer to home and then she needed to work um, three jobs including overnights um, in, order, in order to pay not only her tuition, but also to help support her family financially. And she included as um, a sentence in her letter that while she was working um, in a service profession and, and um, she, excuse me, I get a little choked up when I think about it and I'm trying to also protect her privacy by not revealing too much, but she, um, other students or other employees that were students where she was working were complaining about school and she said, all I wanted to do was take one more college class. And she graduated magna cum laude from Rhode Island College and now she's um, earning her PhD. 
So it's, you know, those kinds of situations, if I hadn't asked more of the questions of the types of things that in this case, she wrote into her own graduate school application essay, but I also would need to understand a little bit more to describe the type of person that she is, the character that she has, and the contextualize that not only did she get great grades, but the fact that it took her longer actually shows her tremendous persistence and, um, you know, every indication that she'd be successful after graduation. So the last thing that I'll end with is just, again, um, the Council on Undergraduate Research, or CUR, is a great organization. I only um, advocate for them because I've gotten a lot out of um, my participation and membership. And um, many of our institutions within CAIM are members of CUR, which means that you get free individual membership and discounted publication rates. So I encourage you to go to their website and log in and, and kind of see, check around what, what might be useful to you if you're at any of these institutions. And if you're not, I'm happy to do it for you um, or share what I've gathered. Um, but, you know, the, again, there's a lot of um, very valuable resources available uh, through CUR and other organizations as it relates to being an effective mentor. Thank you so much, Bria. That was great. And um, now I'm going to switch the controls over to Dr. Alicia Mosley Austin. Um, I have to apologize. I said before that Alicia is the Director of Graduate Recruitment and Diversity Initiatives at URI. She's the assist Assistant Dean of Graduate Recruitment and Diversity Initiatives. Sorry, Alicia. Okay. Um, so uh, the floor is yours. Okay. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today um, sort of echoes what Bria has already said, um, but I wanted to um, talk about some of these topics around the context of how to support um, students from underrepresented backgrounds that you have as mentees as well. Um, so I have sort of three slides of tips and then some resources at the end. And so the first thing I wanted to discuss was something that Bria also mentioned was making your expectations explicit. And these are not just the expectations that this, that you have for your mentees, but also the expectations that the mentees should have of you. And I'll come back to that um, in a few minutes. Um, but first, I wanted to talk about, um, you know, Bria mentioned the importance of managing expectations around different communication styles. You know, whether you want students to come to you directly with with problems or whether there's other people in your research group that you want them to sort of consult for troubleshooting, um, how often you want them to, to reach you, whether, you know, email or face-to-face or -face meetings or the frequency of those meetings, um, be upfront about what your expectations are about how you want to communicate with the student and also let them know sort of what your communication style is. Um, and also get some feedback from the students about what works for them around communication because sometimes um, students from different cultural backgrounds have different communication styles based on their culture that may or may not be a fit with the way that you um, tend to communicate with your mentees. So be open about um, the ways that, you, that work for you to communicate and also get some feedback about what works for your students to see if you can come up with some sort of compromise or understanding about the ways that you, the two of you are going to start your relationship. Um, there's also a uh, discussion about communicating expectations around the research goals, um, and Bria mentioned the importance of situating the work that the mentee is going to do in the context of why it's important for them and their careers, why it's important to the work of your research group, why it's important to the field, why it's important more broadly to society. And so sometimes, um, especially when students have their first experience doing research, um, it's, it's hard for them to sort of see the forest for the trees and how what they're doing matters beyond just, you know, their own educational or academic experience. So being um, explicit about sort of what that, what their work means in a larger context can, can help um, make a better mentoring relationship with the students. Um, and so, let's see, I think that's, oh, and I wanted to come back to making sure that um, as you talk about what you want to, or what you expect from the student about sort of their, their conduct in, in your research group and how they um, can be a good member of your research team in terms of, you know, respecting the other members of the team and being a contributor, um, that you also let the mentee 
um, get a sense of what they can expect from you and the types of things that you can um, communicate to the mentee are sort of what you are going to do for them to help to advance their individual career goals or whether you know it could be that they're just doing the experience to figure out if research is something that they want to continue whether they like it or not um, and to let them know that it's okay um, that doing this experience doesn't lock them into a trajectory of you know going into a PhD program that there are lots of different um, career routes that um, that they're sort of gaining evidence for whether they like or, or, or dislike them and that's a valid experience um, and so th let them know that they can expect that you'll be um, someone who will guide them through those decisions um, or without judgment um, is, is really important um, so the next topic that I wanted to address that, that Bria touched on a little bit is sort of the difference between advising and mentoring. So we, when I think about advising, I think about someone who has specialized content knowledge or experience and is sharing that knowledge or experience um, with a student or a trainee um, so that they can use that knowledge um, and gain from it in terms of you know, how they proceed with their career or with their educational path. Um, but mentoring includes advising, but on top of that, um, includes this sort of personal investment in the mentee's success that is um, related to but not entirely dependent on what you're going to get out of the relationship as a mentor. Um, and so Bria talked about um, coaching or letting students understand that there's a sort of difference between the relationship between a student mentee and a faculty mentor than they may be used to if they've never had a research experience. So oftentimes, especially students early in their careers, their only interaction with professors is as someone who is evaluating them, someone who's providing feedback, someone who's giving them critique, someone who's giving them a grade. Um, and so in your research group, you want to sort of break down that relationship that um, where the, whereas the students may see you as a gatekeeper, they may see you as someone who is um, the one who holds the keys to whether they can move on to their next step in the career. You know, they are concerned about how they present themselves to you because they want to get that good letter of recommendation at the end. Um, so they may have this feeling of intimidation because your role in their academic career um, can be very important. Um, and they don't want to mess that up, and so they they want to um, they might have some sort of anxiety around that. Um, and you may not see yourself as an intimidating person or as a gatekeeper, but you have to understand that from the student's perspective, they have they don't have experience um, engaging with faculty in a more collaborative way. Um, so you have to sort of coach students through that process of making that shift from, from hierarchy to, to partnership. Um, and for students from underrepresented backgrounds, this is even more pronounced. Um, and it's important to note that a lot of the research behind why you know, students don't persist in STEM has to do with not so much the typical things that people talk about, like K through 12, you know, preparation and interest and things like that. It's this sense of um, belonging. And so a lot of students from underrepresented backgrounds have been getting both explicit and implicit messages their entire lives, you know, from larger society and also the people around them, people in their communities, people that they see in school, um, that STEM is maybe not for them, that maybe they should think about something else. You know, you don't see people like you in STEM, maybe you shouldn't be there. And so the students that have gotten to this point that they're now your mentee, they have persevered through all of that sort of programming and sort of cultural sense that maybe they don't belong. And so it's important that you be um, someone who cultivates that sense of belonging in science and understands where they're coming from and their background and the challenges that they face so that you can help them um, see themselves as as scientists and as and as researchers and sort of try and help them overcome maybe prior experiences of being made to feel that they that they don't belong um, and so the mentor plays a really important role in that um, and so I wanted to mention that I was at a conference recently talking about mentoring um, in in neuroscience specifically um, and there was a, a 
a poll that was taken of the audience um, to say, you know, think about your own mentoring experiences and what words would you associate with good mentoring and what words do you associate with poor mentoring? Um, and all, so the top three words that came out associated with good mentoring were advocate, empathy, and listening. So if you go back to what I talked to at the beginning of this slide about how advising is more about sort of sharing your content knowledge, your professional experience, um, those aren't things that you associate with words advocate, empathy, and listening. So mentoring is really about um, sort of holistically, how can you support this mentee as a person um, and advance them towards their goals. Um, and that requires you to know enough about them that they feel like you have empathy for them, that you feel like you're a champion for them, um, and that they can take their concerns to you. Um, the qualities that were associated with poor mentoring, the number one word was selfish, um, the second was absent, and the third was unresponsive. So I know that, you know, as faculty, you're all very busy and mentoring students is just a small piece of the pie for everything else that you do, um, but for students to feel that they're low on your priority list or that you're only um, interacting with them insofar as it will advance your own career, um, that has a very, um, it's a great way to have a bad relationship with a mentee. Um, so the more that you can um, present yourself to the mentee as someone who is um, interested in their success, um, is going to go a long way towards making a positive um, mentoring relationship and in terms of, you know, being responsive and being present, however that means for you, whether that's being in the present, you know, in front of them in their face or being available by email, um, just letting the students know that, that you're, you're there to help them. Um, and so I also wanted to mention that um, in terms of creating this sense of belonging, um, particularly for students from underrepresented backgrounds, but not exclusively, um, is the idea around normalizing um, failure as a part of the scientific process, um, particularly when students have this sort of anxiety that maybe, you know, any mistake that I make is a reflection on me as a person and not just a part of the process. It, it can make them, you know, decide that maybe this is not for them because they don't understand that making mistakes is, is normal and expected and more common than not in science. Um, and when you have students who've been told, you know, by people around them that maybe they don't belong, and then they experience this first um, taste of failure in their research experience, they may internalize that and say, oh, well, this is more evidence that I don't belong and, and, they, and you don't want them to, um, to, to think about it that way. So whatever you can do to normalize failure, to make them understand that um, sort of what their scientific success or whether their experiment works or not, it's not a um, sort of, it doesn't, it, it's not indica an indication of sort of personal, it's not a personal quality um, that, is, is, that is at play, that it's normal and that, um, that can do a, a, a lot of good towards making students feel that sense of belonging and boldening their um, sense of science identity to know that, you know, what I'm experiencing is something that everyone in science experiences. It's not because I'm a bad scientist. It's, it's normal. Um, and so finally, I wanted to talk about um, what you can do in a mentoring relationship where you're mentoring across difference, where you have students that have different identities um, how to reduce the impact of bias in your mentoring relationship. Um, and so in neuroscience, I like to think of our brains as bias machines. We need bias in order to make decisions. Um, so bias is not in and of itself inherently bad, um, but when bias intersects with our knowledge of stereotypes, then that's when it can create problems in our relationships. And the, the best thing that we can do is to acknowledge that all humans are biased and that we have to be in order to make decisions. Um, but there are steps that we can take 
um, so that we can be intentional to make sure that um, the biases that we have and the knowledge or stereotypes that we have doesn't negatively impact um, how we're mentoring our students. Um, and so it's important to note that whether we believe stereotypes or not, um, we all know what they are um, and we can't unknow that, <laughs> that knowledge. And so um, there are strategies that you can use to minimize the impact of your knowledge of stereotypes in your relationships with um, any sort of scenario where you're interacting or mentoring across um, different um, identities. Um, and so one strategy that has proven not to work is to believe that your good intentions are enough. Um, another strategy that's proven not to work is to believe that because you know you're a scientist, you are objective and that objectivity means that you know you're immune from having a biased interaction. That is proven to be a strategy that does not work. Um, so what does work um, in reducing bias are strategies such as stereotype replacement. So if you're um, interacting with someone who has an identity that has um, stereotypes associated with it that you know, um, to think about counter examples, um, maybe, you know, if you're, you know, an engineer and you don't know any other engineers that are, you know, women of color, you know, think of that one example that you, maybe you met someone somewhere else that um, you could think about and think about um, sort of just other evidence that you can find that sort of substitutes for the stereotype that you have. Um, the second strategy is called individuating. And so this is um, the concept of intentionally thinking about um, members of a certain group as individuals and without and think understanding that people have individual characteristics that are that make people that basically that groups are not a monolith that everyone in, in a particular group is not the same um, you see me I'm a black woman and you can't always um, translate my life experience to another black woman's life experience because we're going to be different um, but that's not the same as um, color blindness or sort of race blindness which is a strategy that can cause harm. Um, so what I don't want is for you to say, well, I don't see you as a black woman, so that means I'm treating you fairly. That doesn't help me. What helps me is seeing that I'm a black woman, but also knowing that um, knowing that I'm a black woman doesn't mean that you know everything about my experience because you've known another black woman. So thinking about, you know, I, recognizing and affirming individual identities, but also knowing that um, people are individuals within those groups. So that's individuating. And then the final strategy that I wanted to talk about is perspective taking. And so this is just putting yourself into someone else's shoes. And to do that, you have to know a little bit about what their experience has been. And so um, when you're entering a mentoring relationship, um, you know, you want to talk about your expectations, you want to share a little bit about yourself, and you also want to take the time to get to know your mentee so that you understand where they're coming from and you can meet them where they're at. And so if you know more about the experience of people who share different identities, then it's a lot easier for you to um, put yourself in someone else's shoes and understand the experiences of your mentees a little bit better. Um, so finally, I wanted to share some resources. Um, so there's an organization called iBiology, which has lots of great videos on all types of biology topics, um, but they also have a section of their website where they have videos um, talking about um, how to improve diversity in science through mentoring and also some sort of more basic info about sort of what the status of representation is of, of people from different backgrounds, particularly in, um, in the life sciences. And then the second is the Harvard Implicit Association Test, which is a test that allows you to um, get information about what sort of social biases you hold about different groups of people. Um, and there's a lot of information about how to, how to process the results of that test on this website. Um, and then the third link is for the National Research Mentoring Network, um, which um, has a lot of resources around culturally aware mentoring, 
um, across all career stages. Um, and the image of the book on the right hand side is uh, a curriculum called Entering Mentoring, which um, is the basis for the mentoring workshop that we're going to hold later on in the summer in June. Um, so yeah, that's, those are the resources I have and I'm happy to take questions. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Alicia and Bria. That was fantastic. So does anybody have any questions? Hi, I, Annabella here. I had a question about software that we can use. So um, for collaboration, what would help most, uh, especially with the undergrads, to communicate with them and also to uh, maintain uh, open channels to say share data or pictures that are related to the um, uh, to their surf experience. The, the first thing that comes to mind for me is whatever you'll use. I wouldn't want to impose something that's not comfortable for you. I know I've tried different kinds of software like for project management and things and I forget to use them. Um, because they're not the things I go to, like email and texting. I'm much more comfortable giving my cell phone number out. I give it to my advisees. They never harass me. I don't get, you know, an extraordinary number of unnecessary texts. Um, so that works for me. But I've also been involved with other um, groups. There's um, apps like GroupMe and IMO and uh, WhatsApp and, right, WhatsApp? What's the, <laughs> anyway, um, there are other kinds of things if you wanted to keep your stream separate. Like um, I know the GroupMe one is a really nice interface. So, but I think the most important thing is what you will actually use. Cause you know, what works for you, Annabella may not work for the next person, but um, I don't know. Sunshine, you have any other insights from science communication? Are there effective strategies for? No, I, I think your answer is is ideal because I, you know, for example, I'm um, on several Slack channels, but I never use Slack. Yeah. <laughs> so Slack is some people say it's like the best thing since sliced bread, but only if you use it. Um, so yeah, I think that's a very personal thing. But yeah. is that is that where you were going with that, Annabella? Yes, thank you. I am actually currently using text message. I set up a group text message and the students have been um, tech, uh, using that. I'm also concurrently using Google Drive to share files and uh, to keep like their uh, their weekly uh, plan and what they've accomplished and so kind of like simultaneously to do some feedback and I'm using Google Sheets but within the Google Drive to track the hours that they've been in the lab and what they've been up to. So it's working, but I know I, I was, because I'm doing this for the first time with SURF, I wanted like any advice is definitely welcome, but I really appreciate um, your uh, yours and Bria's input. Thank you. Oh, I have uh, an additional comment. Sorry, Sunshine, and maybe this will prompt other types of questions, but from our last call, um, I think you gave us actually the prompt of something <laughs> else to mention. And one thing I also found in my notes and forgot to mention uh, again today um, that I think is a, a good kind of step back in humility is that students are not impressed by your kind of professional standing um, and how busy you are doing other types of things related to your work. Um, I know that I made that mistake thinking that, um, you know, students would be impressed or think they were working with someone important if I told them all the proposals I was working on, the manuscripts I have in preparation, why I'm so busy, I have to travel to NSF, you know, I have these other things going on. They really care about themselves. And I don't mean that in a way that they're selfish or self-centered. It's just for them, this experience is so unique that um, really what matters, again, goes back to that availability piece and, um, you know, um, responsiveness. And so I had to put, you know, some of that in check to think about how I was explaining my availability and responsiveness and instead just, you know, kind of making it a higher priority for the time that I was working with these undergraduates, particularly in the summer because it's so concentrated for them and they're doing it, you know, in most cases every single day. So it's, it's a real, um, you know, uh, focus time for them. Yeah, and I also wanted to share something that I had written in my notes and I forgot to mention, um, was that when we're, we're talking about um, communicating expectations to, to students um, and sort of the introduction to how you're gonna sort of set up your mentoring relationship um, is 
I think we've all had experiences where we've either talked to someone, maybe it's a student, maybe it's someone else, and we thought we were very clear in how we presented ourselves, but then come to find out later the other person heard something completely different from what you thought you said. Um, so think about ways that you can have the mentee demonstrate that they understood what you told them, um, whether it's just having them repeat it back to you or have them you know, write it down or you know, just send an email summarizing your meeting after the fact. Um, just figure out a way that you can assess whether your communication was effective and whether what you're trying to put forth was understood the way you wanted it to be. One other thing that I wanted to mention, um, especially around um, mentoring across difference, is to understand that you don't have to be everything to, well, just mentoring in general, you don't have to be everything that the student's going to need, you know, in terms of reaching their goals, that you, it's important to know your limits um, and to know what resources you can point to, um, to for students to have help. So you, you don't have to be a mental health practitioner, you don't have to be um, a crisis interventionist, um, so if students come to you with these kinds of concerns, um, be there as a listener, but also be someone who can facilitate connections to someone who can help the students so that you don't feel like you're taking on too much or being out of your depth. Very important point. Thank you for raising that, Alicia. Um, it's very important that you respond to the survey. It's literally three minutes long, so it will hardly take any time at all. Um, but also, in addition to just asking some questions about you know, what you took away from this webinar, it also is a way for us to say, yes, check, you attended this webinar. So it's very important that you respond. And, um, and that's it. So thank you very much, Alicia and Bria, for joining us again today and offering your very valuable insights. And thanks to everybody for joining us. And we, um, we hope you have a fantastic summer with your SURF fellows and um, look forward to hearing all about it soon. Thanks.